It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. A string of critical economic this day, this data this week wraps up with the U.S. jobs report. If we can get there, Yellow's bankruptcy and a strike in Hollywood likely created a drag on hiring. So as we move past that critical data, we're also going to be looking at the ECB's dilemma. We've had data come in there, too, and plenty of ECB speak. Finally, the data also improves in China at the same time. Manufacturing looks better as China moves to ramp up its efforts to support its economy and its currency. Well, good morning, everyone. You made it to Friday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Simone Foxman is in New York. Simone, I don't get the long weekend. Um, I guess I don't need it since I was just on holiday. But for those that do, you really had to work for it, given the twists and turns between markets and, and all the data deluge we've gotten this week. Yeah, I've certainly been working for it all week, but uh, there's lots of conflicting data out there. How much are we going to get an impact of this Taylor Swift, Beyonce driven economy? <laughs> How much are we going to see the impact of the yellow bankruptcy, et cetera? We may get some sign of that this morning. We're looking at stocks, uh, S&P futures pointing slightly higher. Of course, all eyes on that crucial jobs report. The expectation is for non-farm payrolls to rise by 170,000. That would keep the unemployment rate at 3.5%. So we're paying a lot of attention to that. U.S. two years held their gain, uh, yields under 4.9% as we speak. And the dollar index slightly higher here, just a touch. Kit Jukes of SockGen telling us earlier this week, however, that if we see a particularly strong jobs data number, we could see the dollar rally. Uh, of course, watching Brent crude, $87, $87.30 a barrel here, supported by Russia agreeing to extend its OPEC uh, cuts, its production cuts, excuse me. But as you mentioned, Labor Day weekend, Danny, folks in the United States taking to the road and they are nearing, um, according to AAA, a record high for prices that they are going to pay at the pump on a seasonally adjusted basis. How could you take to the road today when at 8.30 a.m. Eastern you've got a jobs report? Come on, folks. you got to stay glued to your terminal at least until that moment. Then, then you can go away to the lake, to the beach, or wherever you're going. Um, Simone, I'm going to kick off at the last thing on my board since you ended with oil. I should say getting commodities excited. It's not just the OPEC Plus news. It's also the stimulus coming out of China. We're going to talk to S Simon White about that in just a moment. You can see it's helping out Dr. Copper. It counts as my European board because it's on the LME, up one and a third percent. Bringing it back to Europe, not a lot of movement today. We've seen this push and pull of the doves really taking over yesterday. Those schnabel comments. It means that stagflation potentially isn't just a concern that's being priced in by traders. It's something that's being discussed by the ECB. It was also in the minute uh, the accounts of the last ECB meeting. But it does mean we've taken a little bit of a breather, a little bit of a pause, perhaps reflecting of waiting for that American data. Euro versus the dollar slightly stronger, while 10-year yield, Simone, push higher by about a basis point. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, let's turn to China as the country intensifies its efforts to stimulate the economy and support its currency. Joining us now to discuss is Bloomberg macro strategist Simon White. Um, Simon, talk me through some of the latest moves uh, by the Chinese government here to support their economy. Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, they're trying to achieve uh, at least three things. So they want to stabilize their currency. Uh, so we saw the um, reduction in the um, foreign exchange required reserve ratio to do that. Uh, we also, they want to support the property market. You know, it's a really big issue in China. Uh, they want to prevent a debt deflation. So we saw some uh, moves in that respect to, you know, reduce mortgage rates, uh, down payments on, um, you know, apartment blocks. Like uh, down payments in China, the tier one cities are still 30 or 40 percent. So they're still quite... Uh, big kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's a big difference there to, to reduce that. And finally, um, also they want to boost consumption. So we saw some tax breaks. Um, so it's really, we're, we're, we're beginning to, you know, incrementally move in the direction. So they're, they're really trying to target the stimulus. They're, they're trying to, um, you know, not go down the route of flood-like stimulus. Um, but really it's building. Um, and at some point, I think it might even have a tipping a point effect. And it, it really does begin to, to bite. We're not there yet, but they, they really are trying to do a, a big deal here. It does seem like markets have started to move in that direction. At least China-related markets are kind of the only thing moving today because we're, we're still just waiting for that U.S. jobs report. Help us set things up for the U.S. What's at stake here with this set of data? 
Yeah, I mean, look, it's going to be very tricky for there to be, um, you know, a very positive number. Seasonally, it's very negative, uh, August, for payrolls. Um, but really, if you look at the trend, the, the year on year trend of payrolls, it's trending down. It's been trending down quite sharply. Um, at the current trend, you get a negative number by uh, the end of the year, a negative payrolls print on the month. Um, but you might get one earlier. If, you know, we, we've now got strikes coming through, so that's really mm. putting negative pressure. But the things I'm watching are temporary help and average hour works. So they're the more leading aspects of the jobs report. So both have been declining. Temporary help is uh, contracting on an annual basis already. Mm. And hours worked has been uh, steadily declining over the last like, year, year and a half. Um, so I'm going to be looking to them because people tend to cut hours before they sack people and they tend to cut the temporary workers before they do a proper layoff. So they're really the more leading parts and the more interesting parts of the report. Don't you think the bond bears are just going to have to send Taylor Swift a thank you message? Yeah, Saying, Thanks yeah. for making sure the numbers didn't cool off too yeah, much. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that story's crazy. We're going to talk about it more throughout the show because um, probably the most fun aspect of the jobs report. Simon, yeah. thank you so much. Simon White there breaking it down for us. We also had a slew of data already out of Europe. It was manufacturing PMI. Uh, the region continues its sustained contraction. Perhaps no surprise there. Joining us now is Bloomberg's European correspondent, Maria Tadeo. Maria, we knew it was going to be bad. How bad was it? Uh, we knew it was going to be bad because this manufacturing picture for the euro area has been a dismal one for months uh, now. A lot of that pegged in, in conjunction with uh, the energy crisis, which, as you know, very well has really shaken a lot of the industrial names uh, in Europe. Now, when you look at the numbers that we got today, PMIs, manufacturing PMIs for August, you look at the euro area, you look at Italy, you look at Spain, you look at France, they are obviously in contraction, but obviously coming deeper in contraction compared to the estimates. So they're all hovering, of course, uh, below that 50 mark, but also going further below compared to those estimates, perhaps suggesting that the pain is not moving anywhere uh, when it comes to the euro area. The other number that I would point to is, of course, the German manufacturing data that we also got today. It is really stuck in that deep contraction uh, threshold below 40 for those PMIs. This is still a story that is hurting the biggest uh, economy in Europe. And again, it is a pains and complicated picture for growth. Some of that also confirmed with the Italian GDP numbers that we got again, point into an economy that is in deceleration. And there's a still the biggest question, which is what happens in the back end of the year? Do we get a downturn that further manifests in the euro area? A lot of this, of course, complicated matters for the European Central Bank, which, as you know, focuses and will focus on that 2% inflation target. But obviously, they operate in a macro environment where now it is very clear it's pointing to the downside. To me, I'll be very interested and curious to see those new forecasts and projections by the ECB in September in terms of the trend over the medium term, just how dire they predict uh, the European economy will be over that near term. Maria, we had Robert Holtzman of the ECB talking about how the bank shouldn't pause in September, should continue to hike. But at the same time, we've got Morgan Stanley saying they've erased their projections of a hike going forward. How are the other governing council members positioning? Yeah, Morgan Stanley has changed its call. They say now that they do not expect a rate hike in September. Remember, this is an open field between that hold or a hike uh, by the European Central Bank. What they cite is the kind of data that I just uh, referred to, uh, this weaker economic growth for the euro area, coupled with the fact that it does seem that some of the services inflation seems to be cooling, putting all of that together. The ECB could make a case to hold in September. I should say I still talk to people who say they still believe there would be a final one in September. So again, some of that debate, I'm pretty sure, will linger almost all the way to decision day. And then that takes me to some of the commentary that we've had over the, well, recent days, but also will continue, expected to continue next week because a lot of governing council members are expected uh, to deliver speeches. When you listen to the French uh, head of the central bank, uh, Viroi de Gallo, he says that at this point, he has not made his mind uh, yet going into that September decision. So again, a lot of that uh, still seems to be pending in the governing council. To me, it seems that, again, this will be a decision that is going to keep us on our toes, which is great news for us. Of course, I guess uh, we're going to Bloomberg TV <laughs> until that decision they expected on September 14th. But again, if we're getting to a point where it's almost every data point uh, matters and we have to look at every piece of data that we get all the way to that September meeting. Come on, Maria, you get enough sleepless nights. We could use more certainty in this world. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a good point. I didn't want to say it, but you said it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Maria Tadeo. Thank you so much for that. As always, we're going to hear from Maria a little bit later in the show, too. All right, let's turn to geopolitics. Russian President Vladimir Putin is moving quickly to take control of the deceased Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin's operations in Africa and the Middle East. Joining us now is Mark Champion of Bloomberg Opinion. Um, Mark, what can you tell us about what exactly Putin is doing in this is instance? Uh, well, so there is a large by now uh, network of operations that was run by Wagner. Um, and this was a, a sort of arm's length operation funded by the Kremlin, often following Kremlin uh, foreign po po policy uh, priorities, but also a money making business uh, for Prigozhin uh, and for the state. Um, and there was an element of de deniability there. Um, Wagner um, was, you know, both very effective, but it was also. Uh, as a tool, but it was also quite controversial. Um, it was, you know, uh, singled out in uh, accusations of murder, rape, etc. Um, and uh, uh, so now, uh, now that you know uh, Prigozhin is dead, um, and some of the other top leaders uh, and founders of the organization are dead, uh, the state is trying to absorb uh, Wagner, and these will now become Russian operations. Mm. Uh, so they're not going to go away. Uh, they could even deepen. They could even become uh, better funded. What we don't know is how you know uh, all of the Wagner units will will respond. Um, we don't know uh, if they'll all want to join the defense ministry. If they won't, um, but they're fairly well paid. They're mercenaries. No doubt the government uh, will continue to do that. Um, and this is a very valuable operation, um, and I think the. Essential thing to think about, you know, to understand about it is that the, the deniability is probably not uh, worth as much as it was before the war in Ukraine. By now, um, you know, the, trying to maintain image uh, is not yeah, extremely right. important. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, in, in one sense, there's change and no change. Mark, speaking of image, uh, Putin has already confirmed he won't be attending next week's G10, G20 meeting uh, in New Delhi. Um, but actually, and now it appears that Chinese President Xi Jinping, according to Bloomberg reports, won't be expected to attend either. Uh, what does Xi's absence mean for the summit? Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question. I mean, it's a G20 summit, so uh, it's uh, you know one of these events that will uh, end with a statement, and there'll be a lot of argument over the text and so on. Um, in terms of you know what comes out in ter as a statement, it, it may not make a lot of difference at all. Um, it will matter to uh, Narendra Modi, the uh, uh, you know the leader in India, um, who for whom this will be a bit of a snub. Um, not having uh, seen there uh, will also be a kind of devaluation of the G20. China is by now, uh, you know, it, it, the, at least the second most important country to uh, to attend after the United States. Um, so, you know, in those senses, um, it, and it is interesting that he was willing to go to the BRICS summit, uh, which expanded uh, in a way that China wanted, um, and where China is really the dominant player. Uh, and he was willing to go and do that, uh, but he's not willing to go to India, where, you know, he has a lot of different tensions. He'll be, won't be the dominant player, he'll be one of them. Yeah, such an interesting point. Mark, thank you so much. That's Mark Champion of Bloomberg Opinion. All right, coming up later this hour, we're going to get the latest on the war in Ukraine and more in an exclusive interview with Mark Gedenstein, U.S. ambassador to the EU. Plus, what to expect from the U.S. jobs report today with Klaus Bader, global chief economist at SockGen. This is Bloomberg. All eyes are on the U.S. jobs report. We're still seeing some lingering effects of the pandemic on the jobs market. There has been a shift to labor, and it doesn't seem to be diminishing. This labor market is still tight, tight, tight. Today, the surveillance team brings you the crucial jobs data and expert analysis at terminal speed. Are we beyond COVID? We are on that path to get to lower inflation by the end of the year. But then you look at the unemployment rate, you're looking at a problem for the Fed. The August jobs report, today on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Simone Foxman in New York. 
So Broadcom shares, they're falling in the pre-market. The Apple chip supplier had given us a downbeat forecast, one enough to send shares lower by more than 4.5%. Let's get the details with Matt Bloxham of Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, Matt, what drove this? Because it seems like there are some things that would help. The AI boom being yeah. a big one. Mm -hmm. So what was enough to counteract that? Well, I mean, pardon the pun, but, you know, Broadcom is a very broad, broad. business. I knew you were um, going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> you are and, forgiven. Uh, yeah. And so what you're seeing is good growth in the AI segment. Yeah, you know, that's clearly where all of their demand is coming from. Um, but on the counter side, you know, they're a very big supplier to Apple. You know, the smartphone market in general is being quite soft this year, um, expected to continue to be a bit soft. So that's kind of counterbalancing uh, the overall trend. So, you know, they saw sales growth of about 5% this quarter. Uh, they're forecasting about 5% growth next quarter, which is consistent with analyst expectations. Obviously, what we saw with NVIDIA uh, and others was like a big beat on sales. So, you know, the momentum is there from AI, uh, but it's probably not as strong as it is with NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. And it's being counteracted by some of these kind of more muted trends we're seeing elsewhere in the technology market. Matt, let's shift to the ARM IPO because it looks like mm. we could get that in just a couple of weeks. Uh, September 13th, I believe, might be the date. Can the chip designer get the $70 billion valuation that they're looking for? Good question. And I guess, you know, obviously next week they're expected to kind of launch their management roadshow. And I think that that's going to be um, uh, what, what answers that question. You know, people are going to have a chance to really um, probe management, understand the business more, understand how things like AI might drive the midterm growth uh, and, and figure out where they want to price it. And obviously this has uh, broader implications than just for SoftBank. This is, you know, for the wider IPO market in general. So there's a number of companies lining up wanting to do IPOs too. And obviously a lot of bankers that have been uh, uh, living off kind of, kind of meagre um, kind of food for the last year or two because the IPO market's been pretty quiet. So I think uh, there's a lot riding on investor appetite for this IPO uh, as a signal for the, the wider health of the, the capital market conditions. Yeah, I've heard again and again, uh Post-summer, things will come back. This is going to be the test, for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Matt, yeah. thank you so much. Matt Bloxham there from our Bloomberg Intelligence team. Let's get to a Bloomberg scoop. Let's be honest, an insane scoop. Simone and I have been talking about it all morning. The European aviation regulators have determined an obscure London-based company supplied bogus parts for repairs of jet engines that power many older generation Airbus A320 and Boeing 737 planes. Um, something that's very worrying. Joining us now is our senior aviation reporter in London, Sid Phillips, who's in the team that broke the story. Sid, look, uh, like so much to discuss here, but I got to start with the question I'm sure is on everybody's minds. If I'm getting on a plane today or tomorrow, what is the risk that I'm flying on a plane with a fake spare part? And what would be the risk of that? So at the moment, it's not really safety critical. The regulators have said it's not really safety critical, but they are looking into it and they've asked airlines to look into their sort of engine records and make sure that if there is part supplied by this London-based company called AOG Technics, uh, essentially they're removed <clears throat> and isolated and essentially replaced by legitimate parts. And that's because uh, the aviation regulator in Europe, EASA, has said that numerous authorized uh, release certificates, which basically accompany parts, have been forged. And essentially, in each case, the, the regulators found that the parts, the certification that was identified was not produced by the manufacturers, and they also did not ship those parts. So it is, seem, it is a seemingly worrying situation, but at the same time, it doesn't really impact uh, flight safety because regulators are on top of it. Sid, I'm glad to hear that it doesn't impact flight safety, but how could this have happened? So it, think of it like a car. So when you send your car for servicing after you bought it from a company, you send it to a garage that uses parts that it may or may not have got from the company. In this case, it's much more critical because your car isn't flying at 35,000 feet. And so it is. Uh, it is the aviation industry is basically... It looks at every single component and every single component is certified. Every single component has a proven origin. And that's really the bedrock of the aviation industry safety record. And essentially, if you have unknown parts, you do not know whether or not they will conform to the specifications they're meant to conform to. And so that, that is really the key, the key concern here. Sid, 
A really great story, Siddhartha Phillip there. Thank you so much for that scoop. One that, now that I've heard from Sid, it's not going to keep me up at night. So I, <laughs> at least I'm happy about that. <laughs> All right, coming up, Wall Street is starting to put more pressure on workers to get back to their desk. Summer is over, folks. We're going to discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Simone Foxman is in New York. Simone, it's the end of the summer. It is September. And the story that caught my eye on that front, we have a whole lot of banks coming out, a whole lot of Wall Street demanding that those who've decided to stay at work come back into the office. It feels like it's getting a new, this, this return to work story. It's really picking up steam yet again. Yeah, apparently return to office now coming up in mid-year review conversations uh, for bankers. Um, most banks determining you have to be back at least three, maybe four, sometimes five days a week. But Danny, I should mention, I don't think the summer is over until after Labor Day, I have to say. <laughs> As someone who doesn't live in America anymore, I've lost all concept of time. <laughs> but that sounds fair to me. It definitely does. All right, coming up, we're going to get back to the markets conversation with Klaus Botter, Global Chief Economist at Societe Generale. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. A string of critical economic data this week wraps up with the U.S. jobs report. Yellow's bankruptcy and a strike in Hollywood likely created a drag on hiring. Meanwhile, ECB officials are weighing their options as they decide whether or not to raise rates on September 14th. Fresh manufacturing data this morning added fuel to that debate. And China ramps up efforts to support the economy and its currency. Sentiment also gets a boost from yet another set of manufacturing data that beats expectations. I'm Simone Foxman in New York with Danny Berger in London. You know, Danny, we've been so focused all week here in the U.S. on what is going to happen to this crucial jobs report. But I feel like there are so many more question marks right now in Europe. Yeah, um, a lot more concerning things in Europe, I should say. At least in the U.S., the data seems to be moving in the right direction. For Europe, it's not. Inflation is still stuck for many regions in that 5 to 6% range. Growth numbers still look bad. We had manufacturing PMIs that came in today, yet another set of contractionary results. And then you have not just Isabel Schnabel sounding something, talking about something that sounds a lot like stagflation. We also got the accounts yesterday of the ECB meeting where they talked about stagflation there too. This is not just a hypothetical being put forward by traders anymore. This is monetary policy setters talking about the risks of stagflation too. We had that traded to a large extent yesterday. The euro weakened by the most in about a month. It weakened about seven tenths of one percent versus the dollar. You also saw yields drop dramatically across the German curve, but of course mostly on the front end. But now it is Friday. It is the first of a month, the first of a month when we're going to get American jobs data. So we've taken a breather on that price action. The euro, it is slightly stronger versus the dollar. Not back at 109 yet, but we are stronger by about a tenth of 1%. We're also selling German bonds today across the, across the curve. Those yields are higher by about a basis point. The other thread, Simone, that is giving us a boost in Europe, especially for metals listed on the London Metals Exchange, is what's happening out of China. We continue to get this Drip feed of different regulation trying to stimulate growth. We've gotten more and more of it around the mortgage mar market, a double R, a reserve ratio requirement cut to all of that lifting copper about one and a third percent, Simone. Yeah, Danny, while there may be more question marks out of Europe, there's certainly a lot of focus on this jobs data, question marks about what will happen there. So is it enthusiasm that we're seeing in the S&P futures this morning? Is it enthusiasm about China? Is it the enthusiasm because everyone here has a long weekend for Labor Day coming up? Unclear, but we are positive after uh, the we ended the month, the end of the month of August, uh, with the S&P down about 1.8%. We're looking at two-year yields uh, falling very, very slightly, maintaining that level below 4.9%. We're now at 4.86%. 
Uh, and the U.S. dollar is sinking just a hair. We heard from Kit Jukes earlier this week. He was talking about how SockGen potentially could see the dollar rallying if we get a strong data number, even though the consensus is the Fed's likely on pause uh, for the September meeting. And, of course, watching Brent crude 87.52, this after Russia saying it would extend its production cuts that it's promised as part of OPEC+. Plus, uh, and also... We have to keep in mind that folks are heading out on the road here in the United States, but they are now, according to AAA, going to pay a seasonal record or very close to a seasonal record uh, at the pump, despite the fact that crude prices have come off a bit uh, over the last year. It's concerning. It's concerning for this inflation picture, Simone, because we know how closely tied uh, consumers' idea of inflation is to the pump. Could we see, at, when we finally have the data coming in, a reacceleration of inflation driven by energy prices? Right. All right, so we've had a lot of data to sift through this week, right? You and I have discussed it to a large dis extent, and so is Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian. He says, though, that markets are overly data dependent. He spoke earlier with Francine Lacqua at the Chernobyl conference in Lake Como, Italy, about the economic challenges facing central bankers. So you have to start at the highest level, which is we are in a different global economy. We are in an economy facing insufficient supply as, to, as opposed to insufficient demand, which is what we had in the last decade. The minute you start with that, then rates are going to be higher for longer. Then you have all the commitments that were made when rates were very low that have to be refinanced, whether it is commercial real estate, whether it is the indebtedness of certain companies that have to be rolled over. And then if you keep on going, you end up with three very different risks. For the U.S., it's about financial fragility in the non-banks. For Europe, it's about stagflation. And for China, it's about deflation. And it's a very different fragmented outlook than what we've had before. I love that last comment, Simone, because it's this idea that during COVID, we had synchronization of global banks. We had easing policy to deal with that. As we've started and gotten further along the tightening cycle, which was also synchronized, things have changed. It's a story to end this year in the second half of global desynchronization. Well, the, to an extent, I mean, we're synchronized in a way, right? The U.S. consumer is pulling back. Uh, we've gotten a lot of signs of that in the last couple of days. In Europe, there are signs that the European consumer, the European manufacturing, uh, pulling back as well. And in China, uh, we've had this story for a long time that the Chinese recovery, whether it's the Chinese traveler or Chinese business, just isn't coming back as quickly as anyone anticipated. I mean, to Mohammed's point, um, there is this minimal amount of demand, and that's really the concern. We've just switched paradigms uh, in the past couple of years. When we talk about what exactly the recovery looks like, what exactly a recession looks like, this is the stat that, that stood out to me, Simone. Among households who use SNAP, so this is, of course, the food program for those at or below the poverty line, 42% skipped meals in August, 55% ate less because they couldn't afford food. That's more than doubles, double of last year's share. Look, for a lot of America... The recession is already here. And especially heading into an election year, at some point you got to wonder, do everyday Americans realize that what happens in the Eccles building is perhaps more important than what happens in the White House? At what point does the Fed also need to pause because a lot of the economic damage has already been done? Yeah, I mean, who cares about the numbers in that regard, right? And we've seen this play out over the course of the earnings season, seen strong results uh, from the likes of the higher end consumer oriented names, the Lululemons in the world. Um, but at the same time, you know, you see, you go to Dollar General, we saw shares there sink, I believe, like 12, 13 percent yesterday, um, in part because the low income consumer is just incredibly weak. So we can talk as long as we want about the jobs market holding up, uh, even, if it, even if we get a below consensus estimate, you know, 150 versus 170, that still means a pretty strong jobs market. But people just not feeling that, right? The demand not there on the lower income side. Yeah. And I, I know you track the retailers really well. Um, how, how much do you know about the shrinking story, Simone? I, I'd seen it a lot of these reports, right, that uh, a lot of the earnings that look poor was due to theft. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's come out in, of, of course, Dollar General, also come out in uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. Uh, just some weird names. And, you know, the question there, um, maybe less about the consumer to an extent, um, but also about how much of this is are just companies not planning appropriately uh, in mm. order to manage some of these challenges. I don't know. I've been to Walgreens in New York. Literally, deodorant is locked up. It's so, insane, uh, you know, yeah. they're doing something. Now, when it comes to jobs, again, Simone, just to remind everyone, 8.30 a.m. Eastern is the time that that's going to hit. As for expectations, non-farm payrolls probably rose 170,000 in August, down from July's 187,000. The unemployment rate, though, that might stay at 3.5%. Let's get to our guest. Joining us now is Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at SockGen. Klaus, thank you so much for running over. Thanks for joining us. Um, do you expect the data to, to confirm a trend of, of softer labor market in the U.S.? Well, yes, sure, I do. Um, but, you know, anything over 150,000 really has to, be call, has to be classified as a very strong number because it substantially exceeds the natural growth rate of the U.S. labor force. And so, you know, clearly the labor market is softening. I mean, you have basically full employment, don't you? Three and a half percent unemployment rate um, and still even though the tightness of the labor market, for instance, in terms of the ratio of vacancies to unemployed, is definitely coming back. You're still looking at a position, in a situation where for every unemployed person in the United States, you have 1.5 vacancies. Hmm. Is it fair to say that there's been a structural shift in this labor market when you look at things like the participation of female workers come down, um, boomer retirements, the gig economy? I mean, it seems like a lot has changed. To what degree is that reflected in, in data that remains stubbornly stronger? Oh, it's hard to say. You know, the labor market, of course, always changes. As uh, the economy, the structure of the economy changes, the labor market undergoes these changes. Certainly, baby boomer retirement is a big factor. And, um, you know, that's not a big, only a big factor in, in the U.S. It's a big factor in the euro area as well. Um, as far as female labor participation rate is concerned, from what I understand, that's actually going up again. Oh, is it? Provide, yes, that's what I understand, although mm. don't necessarily quote me. I say on television. <laughs> I was going to say, you're literally live now, Klaus. I so. know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, I mean, the thing that I, puzzles me the most is this very subdued trend that's not only true in the United States of labor productivity, mm. although the latest U.S. numbers are looking somewhat better. But uh, that's really, that's what I think is so puzzling. And that's why you have this incredibly tight labor market, whereas most economies are not fully back to the pre-COVID trend of GDP. And that is really a puzzle. I call it the, kind of the labor market conundrum, for lack of a better term. Yeah, Klaus, okay, let's, let's consider the hypothetical here. We get a very strong uh, number, maybe 200,000 uh, new jobs added. Um, the question mark for the Fed at this point seems to not be really about September, uh, according to Wall Street. It seems to be about November. Um, how important is the data that we're going to get today uh, to changing the narrative on what we get, not necessarily this month, but November? Does it override, perhaps, the softening uh, in terms of those consumer price index data? Um, yes, absolutely. You know, the, the Fed, of course, has a dual mandate, um, full employment and, uh, and price stability. But that also means that they have a, a big focus on the labor market. And, you know, the, the Fed has done a lot, um, as many other central banks. Although, you know, you can debate whether, after all this tightening, whether monetary and financial conditions truly are tight. And if they are tight, you know, how tight are they? Um, so I think that this number is very, very important because the Fed has to see that its monetary policy tightening is having an impact on the labor market. And, you know, of course, they don't just look at that, but um, the, you know, the, the, the period of sharply uh, declining headline inflation is slowly coming to an end because oil prices, the contribution of oil prices, turning positive again. And, I mean, yesterday's, um, yesterday's consumer spending numbers were extraordinarily strong. So I think the economy is proving and continues to prove to be very, very resilient. Um, and even if the Fed take, makes a pause, um, you know, pause doesn't necessarily have to be a prelude to an easing cycle. You know, it doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. as uh, Hugh Pill yesterday said, Table Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be double peak as well, or twin peak. Right. Well, let me take you back to your side uh, of the pond and talk about 
the tough decision that's facing uh, the European Central Bank. Morgan Stanley out saying they don't see the ECB hiking any further from here. And yet those inflation data, I mean, you look at uh, Eurozone inflation that, that came in at 5.7 percent la uh, last month. I mean, do, do you think that where I guess where do you think the decision's going from there? Because that one's frankly coming up sooner than the Fed's. Well, um, you know, we still have our base case is that they raise for another 25 base point, get to 4%. You know, does it make a huge difference whether we go to 375 or 4%? I'm not sure. Um, you know, yes, headline inflation is declining very rapidly, but uh, you know, I've been pointing out for some time that what the decline in headline inflation does, because it's driven by energy and by food prices rather than by, you know, domestically generated, for instance, labor cost pressures, um, what that means is that it washes, um, it washes purchasing power back into the pockets of households. And that actually increases the underlying demand pressures on core inflation. And if you look at core inflation in Europe, it hasn't hardly declined at all. Headline yeah. inflation is plummeting. Core inflation is basically moving sideways. And that tells you, you know, eventually, uh, it, if the headline inflation goes well below the core rate, but it is, of course, going to converge back to it. And so I think as far as the inflation picture is concerned, by no means are we out of the woods. Um, I think it's going to be, yes, inflation is going to decline, but get to the central bank's inflation targets of 2%. I think that's still an absolutely Herculean task. Herculean task. Is it so Herculean that not only are they going to struggle to get back to 2%, but it'll be in a stagflationary environment that they'll be doing so? Well, you know, stagflation is a term that uh, I really have an issue with. <laughs> okay, okay, what's your be Because, using? because, yeah. you know, yes, you're right. Um, if we're going to have weak growth, certainly in yeah. Europe. And, you know, how can you have strong growth at this level of, of capacity utilization that we have and resource utilization? Um, so we're going to have low growth and we're going to have pretty elevated inflation. So you could call it stagflation, but to me, you know, what really was the key to stagflation in the 70s and the 80s was that you had high inflation and weak growth and evidence of a really big output gap because you had high inflation, mm. rate, high unemployment rates. And that's the key to the stagflation scenario yeah. is that you can close the output gap, but we don't have an output gap. I mean, if anything in Europe, the, uh, the demand is running well ahead of supply. We, we might have in Europe an output gap by actual above potential of perhaps as large as 4%. Mm. And so this term stagflation, I think, is, is severely overused. Yeah. And I think we need to be a little bit careful with the, you know, what terminology we use. I love that, Klaus, but it is much quicker just to say stagflation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to give me, I'm going to need to th think about this. We'll brainstorm for something smarter. Klaus, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, for, really thanks. always appreciate your time. Klaus Potter of Societe Generale. Now coming up, we're going to get more on the war in Ukraine with an exclusive interview with Mark Gittenstein, U.S. Ambassador to the EU. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with Morgan Stanley's chief U.S. economist, Ellen Zetner. That's 7.30 a.m. New York, 12.30 p.m. London. This is Bloomberg. On security, uh, what is happening in Ukraine is a challenge to democracy, not just there, not just in the EU, uh, NATO countries, but really to the world. And what a tribute uh, to democracy that the courage of the Ukrainian people have. Former U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi speaking with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua yesterday about the war in Ukraine. Now, this week has seen fierce fighting with the heaviest air assault on Kyiv since the spring. Ukraine has retaliated with drone strikes on Russia. This happens as pressure is mounting over the ongoing counteroffensive, which allies fear is progressing slowly. Let's get to our Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who is joined by the U.S. ambassador to the EU. Maria. Yes, and I am joined by Mark Gittenstein, who is the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. Sir, thank you for being uh, with us today on Bloomberg. And I want to get a quick word from you on the words that we got yesterday from the Ukrainian uh, foreign minister, Mr. Kuleba, who you know uh, well. He seemed frustrated. He said critics of Ukraine should, quote, just shut it. What we're doing is not, is not easy. But do you worry about the counteroffensive yourself? 
Well, first of all, Maria, thanks for having me back. I really enjoyed our last interview. Um, look, I'm not a military expert. Uh, I did just to give you a little context here, I just returned from two days visiting the D-Day beaches mm -hmm. in Normandy. And what it, the facts that were brought home to me were that it's very difficult to dislodge, especially a dictatorship which has full military power on the Atlantic war, wall you know, 75 years ago in Normandy. Uh, it was a close call. And if you know Bloomberg had covered every minute of that or it was done on Twitter, you would have thrown your hands up in despair. Uh, but these things are very hard to do. You know, uh, I watched where the troops came up in, in uh, Omaha Beach and how, it, what, how difficult it was to break through those machine gun nests. That's what the Ukrainians are doing. And they are as qualified as our military was 75 years ago in Normandy, mm -hmm. and they have the courage and the incentive and the determination to win, and they will. And you say with the Ukrainians themselves, uh, they talk about, they say we're fighting almost for every inch. It's not an easy uh, operation. But then, of course, there's another question now, which is the future of Ukraine and the reconstruction of, of Ukraine. I want to ask you specifically about the reconstruction. This is a very active debate. You're on Bloomberg TV, massive investor community watching this. Is there an investment case in a country that's at war? Well... This is why I wanted to come back. You and I discussed this after the last interview because it should be of particular interest to your audience mm -hmm. who are potential investors uh, in Ukraine. And of course there is. Uh, you know, look, um, the reconstruction process is not just about public money. It's about private money. And we're going to try and do, after this war is over and after the Ukrainians prevail, we're going to rebuild this country, okay? It'll be the biggest such endeavor since the Marshall Plan 75 years ago. And remember, the Marshall Plan was about building institutional structures that create an investment environment. And that's what's happening now through the reconstruction process, through this new platform that's been created by the G7 and the EU. And that is building anti-corruption regimes, transparency regimes, strengthening equity markets, building a regulatory regime that attracts private capital, because if you, that is the only way uh, to build a democracy in a free market. And that's what happened 75 years ago in Germany, and it's going to happen again here. And the final point is, that's what Ukrainians are fighting and dying for, is a free market. And I want to ask you about the details of that framework, because that is impo uh, important for investors. But I also want to ask you about a delicate question. You mentioned yourself, corruption. A lot of people are nervous about uh, the track record of this country when it comes to corruption. Do you have faith that they're taking this seriously. Absolutely. They, no have to, they have to take it seriously for all sorts of reasons. All of the substantial amounts of public funds are conditioned upon mm -hmm. making those reforms. Accession to the EU is conditioned on making those totally. reforms. And most importantly, Ukrainian citizens, brothers and sisters, are fighting and dying for that now. That's what they will insist upon in their political uh, uh, environment. And I think that's why it will succeed in the end. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be done immediately, but it's going to happen. And Ambassador, I have to tell you, I've been to a lot of uh, reconstruction conferences. Many. I was in the UK. I went to Lugano, Switzerland. I was in Paris. A lot of the investors that I talked to, what they say is, yes, there is a good intention behind it, but we don't have the practical tools. We're talking about wartime insurance. They worry about the technicalities of that. They also worry about some of just the everyday operations. What else can be done to reassure this investment community that's watching this, that they have the practical tools they need on a daily well, basis? The most important set of tools they need. I've been in these boardrooms when they're mm -hmm. making an investment decision, and this, in my case, in Romania. You know, I was served as an ambassador there and on a couple of private boards there. Uh, what they need is you need to convince uh, the managers, the money managers, that it's a safe place to invest. And the most important thing for a safe place to invest is transparency, is a regulatory process that's open. It's an anti-regime that actually, anti-corruption regime that actually works. It's a court system that's independent. These things are all going to be built in Ukraine like they were built in Germany and in uh, Western Europe after World War II. And, uh, sir, I also have to ask you, uh, of course, there's a 
U.S. election happening next year. I know the last time we were here, you said to me you were confident that President Biden would uh, win it. But a lot of all of the tools and the reconstruction and, and this help to Ukraine and this narrative around Ukraine obviously depends on the U.S. maintaining that foreign policy approach. When you hear what some of the candidates say on the Republican front, do you worry about it? No, because Joe Biden's going to be the next president of the United States. I don't really worry about that. And I and the other thing that makes it is reassuring is that there's a tremendous amount of consensus between the EU and the United States and all the institutional players and stakeholders on both sides of the Atlantic, no matter who is president of the United States, uh, on the need to, to, to protect democracy and to protect free markets. And that will continue for the rest of our so lives. So if you're a money manager, if you're an asset manager, your message is the U.S. election will not change this? I don't think it you will. You shouldn't bet your money I, depending I, on the I, outcome I of the election? I would, first of all, that's a, you know, a year away is an eternity. So okay. I wouldn't bet my money on that. I would pay particular attention if I were an investor on the conditions that are being set by the various lending institutions, by the European Union, and get involved. People on this call, on this program, should engage uh, with our embassy in, in Kyiv, with AmCham in Kyiv, and find out how they can get, in. there are private sector committees and experts advising the, these platforms. They should be involved with that. You say get in touch with uh, the embassy in right. Ukraine. Well, that's your message is very clear out of this yeah. interview. Ambassador, thank you very much. It's always great to see you on Bloomberg TV. Well, I appreciate thanks for it. Having me. Thanks. And of course, that was Mark Gittenstein, who is the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. And look, his message was clear. Get in touch with our embassy in Ukraine. Yep, absolutely. Maria, thank you so much for bringing us that interview. Hey, Simone, it was really great to spend the past week with you. Just two and a half hours to go until NFP is the average 170, the high estimate 300,000. That's right. We'll be paying close attention to that uh, on the next program, which is Bloomberg Surveillance. But that's it for the early edition as we leave you from New York, from London. This is Bloomberg.